So you can then do sort of polar orbit studies. I'm not going into all the stuff you've done. I'm just trying to write this up. You've got metaplasia going to dysplasia. And you've got the ATC gene goes first. And then what we go, we've got P53 go later on. And then 18Q. And then um, we've got change in P16. So you can start doing polar orbit studies. And the same thing happens. So we're very happy about this. So we're, our hypothesis is quite <coughs> substantial so far. It's on this plus scripts and patches are clonal, caused by clone expansion of mutant stem cells are possible. Patches of clonal are by fission. Dysplasia can be genetically related to metaplasia. And multiple clones exist in the field of dysplasia, but they exhibit a founder mutation. Just like osteochromite. So we have a founder mutation. But what happens in Barrett's esophagus? Now, Barrett's esophagus <coughs> is a very special condition. And I want to convince you it's absolutely unique. This is the American. Party line, right? To speak against this in America is absolute anathema. Um, because Brian Reed in Seattle has cornered the market in this. And so what he's done, the heard the Seattle technique for, um, for, for surveillance in Barrett Softness. Uh, what you do is you do jumbo forceps, quadrant for, uh, jumbo forceps parts so every two centimeters down a second on a six or monthly or a year or yearly basis, and you look at the genotype in particular. And what they've been able to show by looking at is here they're looking at a mutation in, um, in P16 and methylation of the area, and through this long segment of Barrett's nine centimeters, they've got the same mutant clones that spread through the nine centimeters. Now that would be entirely in accord with our hypothesis of mutation fixation and selection. Is that true? Unfortunately, it's not true. This is some work again from my colleague Simon Leader, who said to the gastroenterology, and despite us asking Dr. to go to the read group, went to the read group, and they actually clobbered it. And of course, it wasn't um, published, but Gut took it uh, without change. And so what, he, what he's done here is to take a whole segment of barracks, I'm just going to show you one block, he's taken segments from all the barracks reception all the way down, he's set it out all the groups, and done the genotype. And you can see that there, you see metaplasia, squamous island, low grade dysplasia, high grade dysplasia <coughs> down here. There is no evidence of a founder mutation here. And in 15 reception specimens, we could not find in every single crypt, in every single block, any evidence of a founder mutation in Barrett's. Now, this is anathema, but it's true because we repeated it. And now Carlo Maley, who is a, a Reed's collaborator, also repeated and finds the same thing. If you look at this level, because they were using whole <coughs> biopsies taking whole boxes and just chucking them in. <coughs> and if you do that, you totally disturb the whole architecture. If you look at the individual crypts, and you do that, you find there are multiple clones in that. And so what is happening here is that we've not got this very simple spread of mutations. We've got multiple clones arising in Barrett's. So it's a very complex genetic field. And any hypothesis you might have of having a biomarker of Barrett's goes totally out the window, because we've got these multiple clones and only one clone will eventually go on to malignancy. And how do you know what clone that is? You don't. So it really throws a big spanner in the works of looking at uh, a genetic screening for Barrett's So it's not true for Barrett's office. It's much more complex than each. So, um, you know, this explains the differences between the difference between Barrett's and everything else. Remember, Barrett's is different. Mm -hmm. So, and then, of course, the question comes, where does Barrett's esophagus originate? I don't know if you follow the, the Barrett's literature, but I mean, it's really an embarrassment how little we know about Barrett's esophagus. We haven't got a clue. And, you know, it's, it, it, I think mean, this Bob Riddell is a very, very good um, Canadian, British, actually, in Canada, no, GI pathologist. And he says, um, has a histologic transition from gastroesophageal reflux down to the septum of the has ever been seen in humans? Have you ever seen it? And the answer is no. And we either do not recognize this, or it's not really recognized when regular light microscopy hasn't been done, hasn't been seen. And you see, we all think, everyone thinks, and the, the literature is repeating, people try and transfect CDX2 and CDX1 genes into splinter epithelial models to try and produce barrier And it's uniformly failed. 
No one's ever actually done this. No one has a, has a transgenic model of actually producing in a slime metaplasia by getting the CDX gene into a uh, mass esophagus or he's taking human squid epithelial lines, transfecting CDX2, and seeing you get into slime differentiation. You can do it in the stomach. If you put in CDX2 on the hydrogen potassium ATPase promoter, so it's expressed in the prior cells, you get into slime metaplasia in the mass stomach. But it does not work in the esophagus. And that should be telling us something. It may not come from the spermies at the funeral. So, let's, because we're pathologists and surgeons, we have a great advantage over biologists because they don't think about what they're doing. And uh, uh, when you look at pictures like this, it comes to you. You've got squamous or near squamous islands. You see them here? And they're appearing in the middle of uh, barristers office and retrieval PPIs and or. Um, further therapy. And they appear here, they're, they're totally separate from the, the squamous epithelium of the esophagus. Now, what's happening here? Is the Barrett's epithelium reverting to squamous phenotype? What is happening? Now, the Reed group had this idea um, uh, to look at this. Not first, but they had it. And so what they did in a very interesting paper, they said neosquamous epithelium does not typically arise from Barrett's epithelium. And the way they showed this, they, they got their well characterized patients, you know, with, with, with exactly the genotype of the barrister epithelium, and then they, they dissected out, not by the micro dissection, by just like a surgical uh, scalpel they did it with. And um, they then genotype the squamous epithelium. If you look down there, hard to see, but I'll tell you, in only one case of the 20 did the squamous epithelium share the same mutation as the barrister epithelium. The rest were totally wild. So what is going on here? Where is this wild type of epithelium coming from? Just arising in the middle of Barrett's esophagus. Well, they neglected to read our paper in a much more lowly journal than the Clinical uh, Cancer and Journal of Pathology with Neil Shepard from, from Gloucester. What we'd actually done was to take a series of squamous islands, and, and we had a PhD student who was obviously very courageous, and then done serial sections right the way through these squamous islands. And in every case, you can see here, the squamous island was above an esophageal gland. Down. See it there? So we said we thought these squamous islands came from a soft tube gland. But then, of course, like, like many papers you write, just disappear off the face of the earth, and nobody ever uh, really thought of it. But they, they obviously did read it. But then, what Simon Leader was able to do was to go further and look at the genetic analysis for this. And here, there's a very good section here. You can see here there's a squamous island, and no one over here. But this, this section takes you right down into a soft tube gland, which itself is lined with squamous epithelium. See it there? And what he's done here is to dissect out the surrounding barrett esophagus, which has a key for communication, and that exon there, and then dissect that squamous duct, and that's wild. So this shows that this wild type epithelium is coming on the squamous duct. But you can go even further than that. Is it possible <coughs> that barrett esophagus comes from the esophageal gland duct? Well, Look at this. I won't say over the globe. I should say, I hope it's going to start to think. Here's a gland duct here. You can see the squamous gland duct, yes? And the barrister's office is around there. And we were, Simon was able to identify a silent P16 mutation. Silent means it doesn't cause any change in the protein structure. But you can use it as a marker. And you can see that this P, the silent P16 mutation is found in the esophageal gland duct. And also in the which is very, very suggestive, but it goes even further than that. If you go down to the actual gland itself, you see here there's the esophageal gland down there, and there's the duct going up there, and there's the esophageal epithelium. You can see that the, you can set that to more, and you can see that the gland itself, this ordinary esophageal gland, has got the same clonal P16 sign protection. So Barrett's esophagus, the duct, and the gland share this mutation. So, could be possible you're getting a thing like this, that you've got stem cells for the esophagus are not in the epithelium at all, and I'll show you, I'll mention there's just a few parameters of that, they're found in the guts of the esophagus, remember esophageal gland is found not just in the base of the esophagus, but some somewhere up, and they flow up onto the surface differentiated squared epithelium, and they spread down here giving you the gland epithelium. In the respiratory tract, it's now been established quite 
very well. I mean, the, the stem cells for the tracheobronchial epithelium are in the duct of the submucous line, <coughs> the uh, tracheobronchial epithelium. So, and also, the same thing occurs in the pronotal as well. So, it's an interesting hypothesis. But I think what interests me is the fact that we've got multiple clones, and multiple clones in parrots, and you've got multiple gas uh, esophageal glands, and it's impossible they arise from the esophageal glands, and that's the cause of multiple clones. Don't disagree because surprising things <laughs> do happen in biology. So don't throw that in the that, that So um, just finally, I'm just thinking about what's happening here. You know, we think about the sort of metaplasia, uh, dysplasia, carcinoma sequence, and you know, we have the and this is clone evolution of our soft. We talk about this very in a very facile manner. But we tend to sort of fit the we fill our, the our facts onto the theory rather than the, uh, the theory onto the facts. So I think, you know, if you've got multiple clones, you're going to have to find, say, where they come from. And